Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. My name is Maria Halso. I'm from JetBrains, uh, and I'm going to talk to you uh, about code review today. Before I begin, though, I would like to ask all of you, if you have a question during my talk, to send it to me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is on the slide. Uh, this way, it's going to be easier for me to answer every question, and for you also, because if you have a question in the middle of the talk, you don't forget it, you just type it, and uh, you will be sure to get an answer. Um, this is my roadmap for today. I'm going to be talking about code review benefits for those who do not necessarily do code reviews yet and maybe not uh, know what the practice is about. I'm going to talk about things you need to keep in mind if you would like to start the practice uh, in your team. And if you already do code, re code reviews in your team, um, you can take a nap through these two parts and just ask your neighbor to wake you up for the next part, how to make the code reviews efficient. It, I know you had lunch, so <laughs> sometimes a nice nap after lunch is a good thing. So go ahead, the first two parts, if you do code reviews already, you can uh, relax. Uh, so I'm going to do, uh, um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to make the most of the, out of the code reviews. What are the problems we're trying to address? What are the things uh, we want to look for? And the last part, uh, it's actually my favorite. Uh, I'm going to talk about code review feedback and how not to start secre secretly resenting each other over the comments and not to start a fight. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, major questions uh, for those who uh, haven't started yet. Is why review code at all? Um, because code review is basically a practice where uh, one developer take, uh, looks at uh, the changes made by another developer. And uh, we already have IDEs uh, with uh, static code analysis, with uh, uh, we write tests, we have continuous integration servers running all kinds of checks and tests and everything. So why should we do that? Um, the thing is, yes, we do try to find bugs as early as we can, and we have all those tools to help us with that. But the reality is that there are some issues, some problems, some bugs that will uh, be that can be noticed only by a human being because of their um, because of the way they are, because uh, they require understanding context of the problem, or context of the whole project, or sometimes it's just things that can go undetected by the tools. And um, so the first benefit is normally. Uh, listed as finding bugs. Normally, when people start doing code reviews, they say we're going to find, we're going to, uh, we want to find more bugs in our code, and that's how we started too. We started doing code reviews to find bugs, but through the years, we discovered there's so much more to this practice. There are so many things that you can get from reviewing each other's code, and for example, uh, knowledge sharing. When you look at someone else's code, you can learn more about the project, about the code style. Uh, you can uh, just become a better developer from reviewing someone else's code so for some from someone who has more experience. And also, when somebody reviews your co code, they can comment on it, and you can learn something from their comment as comments as well. Uh, this also gives you faster onboarding for new team members. It's faster to get familiar with a code base if you do code reviews. It gives you easier code maintenance because uh, many times at code reviews, people point out things uh, that can uh, help make the code more maintainable. So uh, that helps too. We also get increased bus factor. Uh, anybody not know what that is? Okay, quite a lot. So, uh, bus factor, it's a measurement of the concentration of information in individual team members. To, to, to put it simply, um, how many people would it take to get hit by a bus so that your project is stalled or even falls apart and you don't know what to do? Basically, if there's one module and only Bob has ever committed to it and he's the <laughs> only one who knows what's happening there and it's and he quits, uh, he's hit by a bus, or whatever happens to him, and you don't know what to do, uh, that's really bad. So that means bus factor is number one. When you 
uh, review each other's changes, you learn more about the project and thus you gradually increase this, uh, this number. And um, we get better team collaboration because uh, we have uh, technical discussions in the context of the code, so not just in the kitchen, but exactly in specific lines, talking about specific details, and uh, we get better context. And of course we get improved code quality, but it's not exactly the same as finding bugs, because many times the issues we discuss are not exactly bugs, but some sort of improvements, some uh, alternative solutions and implementations, some uh, better options, and so on. So it's not a per se about finding bug, but it does make your code better. Where do we start? Uh, there are four key aspects to the success of code review practice if you want to begin uh, doing this in your team. And there's essentially your team, the change impact process, and the new tool. You have to keep them in, mi in mind if you want to start. The team. Um, this is, by the way, my team, or at least the way I see them in the Slack channels. <laughs> and. Um, how many of you, when you just started uh, lear uh, learning to be a developer, um, I, like me, when I was um, just at the university and I was studying computer science and I thought, well, I'm going to work with computers, I'm not going to deal with people. How many were like that? <laughs> yeah, so the reality is there's a lot of uh, teamwork, there's a lot of communication. And you talk to developers, uh, to, to users, you talk to your QA. And code review is another practice that involves communication in, uh, to a huge extent, uh, to in fact. So you need to um, be sure that your developers understand why they are doing code review. So if you have this brilliant idea, I'm going to uh, introduce code review in my team, you have to make sure to communicate to your team and uh, explain to them why you want to do this, how it's going to affect their da daily routine, listen to their concerns, what do they think, because many people can think it's a waste of time if because they don't understand the benefits. Uh, and you would like to cultivate uh, code, code review culture, like sharing best practices, discussing with your team which particular pro problems are important for your project, uh, and partially, maybe, you, you will need to address the issue of code review feedback. The next thing is change impact. You need to think about who's going to review changes and who's going to participate in uh, code review. Uh, if you're a startup with five team members, that's pretty easy, everybody probably. If it's a bigger organization, it might be more complicated and you might want to start with a team or two and uh, try it on, uh, adjust the process, find the right tool and things like that. And also you want to think uh, what are you going to review? If you're just starting, then reviewing everything in the beginning may not make sense. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. So you may want to start with um, uh, reviewing new commits, for example, or new changes. Um, and also, maybe not necessarily all the new changes. Perhaps you want to say, okay, we have this critical path um, in our system and we want to start reviewing just things in there. And then if you, when you get the hang of it, when you adjust your process so it works smoothly, you may want to extend to um, uh, other parts of your project. Um, and when, oh, sorry, and when, this is pretty simple, uh, uh, just uh, don't start doing code reviews two weeks before release. <laughs> Nobody's going to like it. And uh, also at the times when nobody cares, uh, like uh, two days before Christmas, uh, everybody will forget and um, just pick some reasonable time to introduce the practice. Process. Um, think where it fits in your current process. There is no need to invent a bicycle. If you're already doing pull requests, you're pretty much doing code reviews already. 
if you're just committed into some version control, you have some process, maybe you want to think of uh, feature uh, review and feature branches or uh, specific commits, just try to think where it fits in your process. Keep the workflow simple. No need to uh, think, no need to uh, create too many rules because it's going to get confusing. The simpler it is, uh, the, the better it is in the beginning. For example, there's a commit. Uh, one person from this group of people has to review. If it's good, it's good. That's it, for example. Don't be scared of iterations. In case of code review, it's actually a good thing because um, it's uh, a process where you have a commit, then somebody reviews it, and sometimes, there are, well, most of the times, there are some comments that need to be addressed. Like there's a problem found, so there's a fix. And that's a good thing because that means it actually works. It actually, you got an uh, you've made an improvement. So iterations are generally a good thing. Um, there were many studies that suggest that uh, two reviewers is the best number, but th this mostly because um, when you invite a lot of people to see uh, one change, uh, there is an effect of uh, social loafing. So you are one of five reviewers and you think, well, there are other four smart people there. They will find something. I don't need to pay too much attention. And everybody thinks like that. And then in the end, everybody is less efficient reviewing the changes. So it's better to have uh, one or two people. They have more responsibility to, to find uh, problems and uh, uh, to uh, leave you code review feedback. Sometimes one is enough, but in case if you're uh, involving junior developers to review code, that, uh, code, they tend to find less problems, so you want to balance it out with a senior. So there is learning and there is um, uh, finding problems. But yeah, no, do not invite too many people. Review often. Um, the more often you do it, the, the, the better you become at it and the more familiar you are with the code base, so the easier it gets over time, like with anything else. New tool, of course, there's a new tool. Uh, if, you, um, if you're just using some, uh, if you're not using pull requests or something like this, then you're gonna have to uh, have a new tool. We're using our own tool, AppSource, uh, but there are like do dozens of other tools on the market. You can find the one that fits your environment, your version control, your process, and supports, um, whatever extra needs you may have uh, and doesn't stand in your way. That's the most important thing that you should um, look for in a tool. It has to enable conversations but not make it overly too complicated. So summarizing the, um, this part, talk to your team if you want to start doing code reviews, address concerns, Consider your process and where the code reviews fit in there and uh, how um, it's going to impact your uh, general workflow and your uh, daily routines. Find the tool and you are good to go. Now that we can level it up. So we can think of how we can make it more productive. That's the thing. We can just uh, use... Uh, simple editors, but we go for more productive editors. We try to optimize our processes, whatever we do, and there are ways to do code reviews more efficient, regardless of how you do it. So one most important thing uh, to know is that uh, code review is not a replacement for all the other techniques that you're already using. You still need to write tests and uh, run them on your continuous integration server. You still need to use uh, static code analysis, spell checker, whatever you have. Whatever you're using it now, code review is not a replacement. It's, uh, uh, if you can find issues automatically, do it. Use the tools. And one very, very, very important thing, I cannot stress this enough, code review is not a place to fight over tabs, spaces, and things like that. If you need to ensure that the whole team uses the same code style, you can uh, share uh, code style templates in your ID or uh, use a tool like check style or whatever to ensure that it's formatted the same way. But 
there it's a waste of time and it's like one of the biggest wastes of time during the code review. Don't do that. As a code author, you can help a code reviewer um, do a better job. There's a number of things they can, you can do and these are generally useful things to do even if you don't do a uh, code review. Review your own code before you commit it. Um, there were studies that shown that um, if you double check what you do before you commit, you reduce the number of issues by half. And even if you don't do code review, if you don't, just, just this uh, doesn't take too much time, but this actually helps to reduce the number of problems. Commit small changes, generally a good practice, and it's also helpful for a code review. If you jam in one commit um, and you feature a couple of bug fixes and a refactoring on top, it's gonna be very, very hard to make sense of it. You see a change that includes so many things, uh, it's really complicated to understand what's going on. And it's also, of course, it uh, makes continuous integration easier. Uh, you have less merge conflicts and so on and so forth. Other benefits of this. Uh, document your code if uh, there is a need to and provide a meaningful commit message so the author, uh, so th sorry, the reviewer will be able to understand what exactly this change is supposed to do. As a reviewer, there's um, a, no a number of things that you can do to be more efficient. Uh, do not drag it, do not postpone it. It's very um, tempting to uh, get distracted uh, by, by other things but and um, leave code review to tomorrow and again to tomorrow and again to tomorrow and then m one month later <laughs> somebody very annoyed comes to you and says, my code review, where is your feedback? Um, the reality is it's possible to find time for a code review within 24 hours or at least within a week. For example, do it the f you don't have to stop what you're doing right now, uh, but you can do it first thing next morning, for example, before you started everything else. Um, after lunch, again, before you started doing everything else. Or the last thing at the end of the day, if you have time. Um, so it is possible to find time and it doesn't have to t uh, take too much time. Um, Normally, when we spend more than an hour looking at the same change, we tend to stop noticing things. And chances are, if you didn't find anything within an hour, you will probably not fi find anything within the next hour or two. So limit yourself to one hour maximum. And then chances are there's nothing really bad with it. So maybe there is just nothing too wrong with it. It happens. Um, keep in mind your project priorities. For example, if you have a performance critical system, maybe you want to focus on performance part of it. If there are requirements, uh, if uh, security is a priority for you, then focus on that. You know your project, you know which are the weak parts, you know which are the things you need to uh, be concerned about. So keep that in mind. That's of course useful during the code review as well and apply your expertise. If you have background in certain areas and you have knowledge of, um, well again, for instance, pr uh, how to tune performance and some practical tricks, you can apply it too. And that you can bring your experience to the table. You can, uh, your input uh, will be very valuable because you have experience in this area. The other person may not necessarily know about things that you do from your uh, background, from your uh, um, experiences. <laughs> uh, another thing is uh, what to look for in, in, in a code review. What kind of problems do we want to address? I'm going to give you some very, very general pointers, just broad ideas, because in each particular case, depending on the project and language, it can differ a lot. But for example, general and business logic, uh, does the code do what it's supposed to do? If there are requirements, does it meet the, requ uh, the requ uh, requirements? Um, 
there are coding errors accidentally using and instead of or, of by one errors, um, accidentally pointing to a test database and stuff like that. There's uh, business rules and logic. Um, for example, sending a notification twice is not as bad, but uh, for instance, accidentally giving 55% uh, discount instead of 5% just by typing accidentally twice number five. This may damage your business, your company's business, and this is not something that can be found by a tool. Um, check user messages, if they're correct, if they're clear. Uh, architecture and design are the things that should be discussed before code review, but uh, way before code review. But there are still some things that you can notice from this perspective during a code review. Is the code in the right place? Uh, is it reusable? Or uh, maybe it could have reused some of uh, uh, the code that you already have. It happens quite often in big projects when a reviewer comes and there's like s many lines of code and then uh, a reviewer notices that, well, we actually already did that. You could have called these two methods and you didn't need to write all this again. Um, then the uh, next thing is, uh, are you using correct data structures in this case, in this particular context? Uh, does your code follow, uh, follow solid principles or a domain-driven design or whatever other uh, paradigms uh, your team favors? Is it over-engineered and too complicated for no reason? It may uh, turn out to be uh, um, over-engineered keeping in mind the features that are, that are next to follow or not. Sometimes it's just uh, over-engineered for no particular reason. But that's at least something you can ask the code author and see where it goes, if it's really needed there. Uh, readability and maintainability. This is a really good quote, very known. Uh, always code as if the person who ends up maintaining your code is a violent psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> And good advice. Uh, take a look at the names. Do the names reflect what they represent? Ask yourself, can I understand what this code does? Because if you don't, chances are the next person who ends up maintaining it also is going to have trouble understanding what it does. Is it well documented? Is uh, Are there enough... Uh, uh, test coverage. The thing is, you can have all kinds of test coverage tools, but they never give you, well, th that's like a unicorn, 100% test coverage. It's almost never like that. But the important thing is, and what you can understand is which parts have to be covered by tests. So you can see if they are. Then there's performance, and if you have performance requirements, you can check if they're met. Uh, you can take a look at the performance tests, how they are. Um, if they, you can look at common causes of performance problems, uh, like um, making too many uh, network calls when there is needed. And in case of mobile devices, for example, it's going to cost you not only performance, but also uh, battery life. Um, Potential memory leaks, uh, not closed connections and streams are typical offenders, um, or too many calls to the database. These are like very typical things. You may want to look at uh, the security, and of course, there are tools that will check many things like SQL injections and things like this. But uh, one of the uh, big areas where security vulnerabilities can creep in into your system are a uh, third party libraries, and at least you can check if this code introduces new dependencies. That's one thing you can look, uh, you can see. Uh, you can see if new paths um, and services need to be authenticated. Uh, does the data need to be encrypted? Does the code uh, properly manage secrets? You can look at some uh, gray area potential issues, like for example, uh, instances of Java Util Random uh, in Javadocs. Uh, it says that it's they're not cryptographically secure, which is perfectly fine if you're just generating a number. But 
if you are using it to um, for something like session IDs, uh, password reset links, and stuff like that, maybe it's better to use a secure number instead of random. Uh, secure random, sorry, uh, instead of random. Um, and this is there are many uh, gray areas like this which uh, you can look at. Now there is my favorite part. You can pretty much figure out what you want to look for uh, in a code review based on uh, your experience and um, your project's needs and the the way uh, it's supposed to be built and many things uh, that are part of your professional experience. And this is the one thing that I normally get most questions about, like, Okay, well, I, I'll, I'll, know, I'll find the problem, but we have most of the problems um, with the code review feedback. For example, um, recently somebody sent me this link to this tweet. This actually happened to somebody. Um, so for those who doesn't see, a uh, reviewer, why are you doing this? Me, explains function call. Reviewer. No, like as a profession. Um, we can be really, really mean. Sometimes on purpose, so sometimes by accident, because of cultural difference, not knowing the language and whatnot. I have some, I, I asked around, I asked uh, uh, my teams and on Twitter, I have some ex good examples of uh, code review feedback, actual code review feedback. Um, for example, this is all real. Instead of touching other people's code, do something useful with your life. Um, another one. Look at the bullshit you wrote. Um, this is actually not uh, from our company nor from Twitter. It's just a very famous example of code review by a very famous person. Uh, the above code is shit and it generates shit code. It looks bad and there is no reason for it. It's a quote from a long email. Look it up if you want to. Um, but it's not always offensive and aggressive. Sometimes it's just confusing. Uh, for example, comments must end with a period in the code review. Really? That's the feedback? Uh, OK. Another one. Um, something is wrong. I'm not sure what it is. I ju it just doesn't feel right. You know what I mean? <laughs> no. I don't. It, and we get, I'm pretty sure everyone received, uh, if not offensive, at least very, very confusing feedback. If not on code review, then on issue tracker, in email, somewhere, maybe personally. And many times I can understand where this person is coming from. It feels like this. It does. So we'll need to learn how to give feedback. Uh, and um, But first, when you're typing that message, um, uh, that that's you're leaving this code uh, review comment, you can ask yourself, why are you doing this? Well, you're probably thinking, well, that's a silly question. I found a problem. There's a problem. I'm leaving feedback. Turns out there are more reasons than that. So yes. Most of the time we leave uh, this comment because there is a problem. Sometimes we won't help someone to improve, and that's also another good reason to leave a comment. Um, sometimes we want to start a discussion. That's another good one. To praise good work. That's good too. If you notice something really exceptionally good, uh, just say it. That's a good one. Um, but sometimes we feel pressured, uh, pressured to find a problem and start need picking because They've asked me to do a code review. If I don't leave comments, does it make me a bad developer? And I'm supposed to find problems. So many times people, s uh, well not many times, but sometimes uh, people leave comments and feedback out of this reason. And that's not a very good reason to um, leave uh, feedback in a code review. And other times we do it to boost our own ego to show off, to establish our superiority, I know better, and things like that. So if you give feedback for the first four reasons, do it the other two, you may want to reconsider what's exactly the problem here. 
uh, there are some, I call them code review feedback manners. Uh, leave feedback if your goal is improvement. Improvement in the code quality, uh, helping someone else improve, or you asking a question to maybe improve yourself. Uh, please do it with appropriate timing and place. So for example, don't drag the review, leave them not one month later, but try to leave it as, uh, your feedback as soon as possible. And by place, I mean, if you're using a code review tool, leave the code review feedback there, not in Slack, not, oh, line 78. You know, there is some really weird thing written there. It, it, and this, me this message is in Slack. Does it kind of doesn't make sense. You're just making things too complicated. So right timing and place. Um, Indicate when you're done with the review. That's some good manners. For example, if you are using a tool review that has accept, reject, raise concern, approve, whatever buttons, they're basically there to, to let the other person know, I'm done with the review. Uh, if you're using GitHub pull requests, just, uh, just emoji or thumbs up, thumb down, uh, just let the author know that you're done. Um, Discuss changes, not people. Um, many times I see advice that, um, well, we're discussing changes, don't take it personally. But the thing is, um, it is personal. The code author had some time thinking of a problem, came up with a solution based on the experience, based on uh, some logical reasoning and uh, um, so it is personal. That is exactly why we should consider how we give feedback. Um, because it's, uh, it feels like it is our work. And when you say that um, we're criticizing work, don't take it personally, it gives us the freedom to say whatever offensive thing that we want to say. So it's the other way around. It is personal. That's why I consider how you say it. And that's, yeah, that's uh, the next thing that I was going to say. Um, carefully consider how you put it, the, the, the wording, the, your, the way you deliver this uh, feedback. For example, don't be rude. It may seem obvious, but I'm not just saying, um, don't call each other names. Even if you say this is stupid code, it still sounds aggressive and offensive. Even if these uh, rude words are not directed towards to the author, if they're still there, it already makes uh, the one who's going to read it feel uh, like getting defensive and or ignore it or uh, trying to explain it away. And or uh, this is not gonna. This is not a good start for a conversation if you want a positive outcome out of it. Assume that the code author is intelligent and qualified person. Um, assume that the, this um, implementation uh, has some reasoning behind it. For example, if you think that it's not going to work if in this particular scenario, uh, you, there's one way you can do it. This, you can say this will not work if blah, blah, blah. But if you say, what happens if blah, 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 you kind of give uh, this window of opportunity for the author because uh, you kind of assume that they already thought of it and they will explain to you why they did it. Other otherwise, you just state that they didn't. And if they didn't actually think of it, there's the when you start your feedback with a question like this, uh, you're inviting them to discuss the problem, not just stating that you didn't think of that, fix it. And if they thought of it, actually, they will explain it to you why they did it this way, and you may actually learn something. Maybe you didn't consider all the, all the things there. Avoid using words like obviously, simply, just, why didn't you just, that sounds demeaning. It's like, this is so, Obvious, even a stupid person could do it. Why didn't you see it? And the words like obviously, simply, they make it the whole effort behind it meaningless. As and we 
um, make the person feel like he's very, very unintelligent. Avoid possessive adjectives. There's a difference when you say uh, your method returns something wrong and this method returns something wrong because when you um, say your code is bad, your method is wrong, your uh, solution is, uh, is not good enough, you make it again uh, sound like a personal attack, not like a discussion of the code. Mm. There's another uh, things like be specific, like in that case, something is wrong, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't help anybody. Uh, if you see a problem, be specific what it is, uh, it's going to help the other person faster uh, uh, realize what can be done about it or uh, it's not going to stall the whole conversation forever. Don't make demands, ask questions. If questions, they invite for a technical discussion. Demands uh, make people mm, try to get defensive instead of trying to see the reasoning and everything else. Don't use sarcasm. That doesn't work. Mm -mm. Not everybody is capable of getting sarcasm when they speak to each other. When it's written, it's even harder. Suggest alternatives if you know a better solution. Uh, but then again, the in this case, um, if you are suggesting alternatives for the only reason that you would have done it differently, that's not necessarily the best uh, way to go about it because um, there is a certain level of quality that is acceptable for everybody and above it, it's just trade-offs and not all solution, uh, there are many solutions to the same problem and if somebody does it differently, it's not necessarily worse. So you might want to consider why you're suggesting alternatives. So you gave feedback and maybe you're very, very good at it. And But the thing is, once it's out, uh, you cannot do anything about it. The, pr the person who receives feedback can decide whether to uh, get defensive or uh, reply or uh, fix a problem or ignore completely. And many times, even if you are good at feedback, uh, other people are not. Other people are not. And you are, um, you, even if you're very good at it, you still yourself will have to deal with a lot of feedback, which is really bad and worded in a really weird fashion. And we all also need to learn how to receive feedback. And that's maybe even more important because there will be more feed weird and strange feedback, but it, there may be some good, useful message in, in it that we can learn from. And before we learn how to receive feedback, we need to acknowledge that feedback actually helps you improve. Not all of it, but many times, even if it's written in a weird manner. Um, for example, uh, this is not from a code review, but I was given a talk uh, about code review. And um, after the talk, uh, a, a person came to me and said, I was at your talk. Uh, oh, cool. Did you like it? And she said, I really enjoy women uh, talking at technical conferences. I wish you were better. <laughs> and, um, the, you know, this, this second, for a second, the thoughts that are coming through your brain are like, well, let's see how you do it, and or something like this, like just to get defensive and say something mean back. But instead, I just like took a deep breath and contained myself and said, like, what is this exactly? Did you was I uh, that I did was wrong, what, or like you didn't like or something? Turn out, turns out um, that time I was really nervous, and uh, I kept looking back like this at my slides, and well, that is annoying. So she said that to me, you turn your back on the audience a lot. And that was useful because that's something I can work on. That's something that helps me. But often we get this first message, we get defensive or we just ignore it. And we don't learn if there's actually anything from there that we can learn. So 
um, there are many things that you can do uh, to help find this message in the feedback. For example, invite p uh, teammates to review your code. If it's not like everybody, if you're just reviewing only certain commits, invite them. When feedback comes unexpected, it's harder to deal with it. If you invite people, you're ex already preparing for a feedback. Uh, separate criticism from self. And that's something that needs to be done on the receiving part. Um, some people react to feedback differently. Some, um, the same feedback, the same actual sentence, the same word can seem like a complete disaster and a tragedy to some people and others will be like, whatever, we'll fix it. And um, you know who you are. You know how you receive it. And many people, um, when they receive uh, feedback, criticism, and they see, for example, um, this method, th this method's names uh, doesn't reflect what it what it actually does, and some people will read it as, I suck at naming methods. <laughs> but you need to see that they are talking about this particular method, this particular name, about this change, not about your personal skills, unless they specifically state it. So, but <laughs> that's something that we need to practice and see. Ask follow-up questions. Um, they help to uh, get to this useful message if it is there. Um, continue your immediate reaction, take a pause, if, and especially in written feedback, it's easy. You can just, you see feedback, and it sounds like they're just attacking you. You don't type right away what you think of them. Take a moment, think about it, and then uh, try to ask follow-up questions and get to it. It's not always there. Sometimes do people mean offensive things, but most of the time, it's not. Most of the time, there is something useful in it. Ask questions. And when you get useful, really useful feedback that helps you improve your code or learn something, say thank you. And I'm really looking forward to your feedback. Thank you.